Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for Science Gallery Bengaluru's Contagion and this extremely interesting panel discussion that we are going to start very shortly. As you know, Contagion is our fourth exhibition season that is entirely online and explores the transmission of diseases, emotions, behaviors, and more. Today, I'm very glad to have with us five experts uh, to have a discussion on packing COVID-19 uh, led by Sara Iqbal. I'll quickly introduce to you all our experts and I will hand over to get this discussion going. Professor Ajit Lalwani, uh, who we're very pleased to have here today, leads a multidisciplinary program of public health research to protect the health of the population from the most serious respiratory infections, flu, TB, and COVID-19. The Health Protection Research Unit is a national level interdisciplinary partnership between Imperial College London, Public Health England, the Royal College of General Practitioners Surveillance Centre, the University of Oxford and several NHS hospitals. Ajit's patient-based research aims to understand the body's natural mechanisms of protection against TB, flu and SARS-CoV-2. He translates his discoveries into innovative practical solutions to improve patient care and public health. The, our next panelist is Dr. Aksa Sheikh, uh, an MD Community Medicine, who is an Associate Professor of Community Medicine at Hamdard Institute of Medical Science and Research, Jamia Hamdard in Delhi. She is India's only transgender woman to head a COVID vaccination center. Aksa is an investigator in clinical trials of the Sputnik V vaccine and WHO Unity Studies for COVID Epidemiology in addition to two internally funded projects on transgender care. She is a proud transgender woman and works on LGBTQIA plus rights, rights of persons with disability and mental health. She has a keen interest in medical ethics, humanities and education technology. Our next panelist is Professor Giridhar Babu, who is the head of the Life Course Epidemiology at the Public Health Foundation of India. He has his um, MBBS from the Kasturba Medical College, Manipal, and has completed his MPH and PhD from UCLA. He has two decades of experience in public health research, practice, and academics. He began his career at the Center for Community Medicine of, of Ames, New Delhi, and next moved on to work at the World Health Organization, where he led efforts in stopping polio transmission in Karnataka. He initiated advocacy for measles surveillance in Karnataka as well, leading to the constitution of a multi-year plan for measles elimination in India. Our next panelist and uh, academic advisor to this exhibition is Professor Shahid Jameel. Shahid began studying chemistry at Aligarh Muslim University and IIT Kanpur, India, and obtained a PhD in biochemistry at Washington State University. His postdoctoral work in virology was at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center in the USA. In 1988, he set up the virology group at ICGED, New Delhi, and led it for 25 years and researched human viruses. He is formerly the CEO of the DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance from 2013 to 2020, and is now the director of the Trivedi School of Biosciences at Ashoka University. Our last panelist is Dr. Yogesh Kankorde, who is a public health researcher and neurologist. He is trained in India and the United States in medicine, neurology, neuroimmunology, and clinical research. He has immense experience in working on micro to macro aspects of health. Ten years ago, he left his job in the US to work with tribal and rural communities that have limited access to care. He works at Search, a non-governmental organization in Gadchiroli, Maharashtra. And finally, before I hand it over, I'd like to introduce to you our moderator for today's session, Sara Iqbal. Sara is trained as a researcher in life sciences and is currently a communications and public engagement practitioner in India. She holds a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Oxford and was a postdoctoral researcher at the Scripps in USA before joining the Indian Science Funding Agency, the DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance. So uh, I'd like to now hand over to Sara, and I'd also like to let all our uh, members uh, in the audience know that this is an interactive session. So please do put your questions into the Q&A box and Sara will uh, share them with the speakers towards the end of the discussion. If you're watching on YouTube as well, you can add your questions in the chat box. We'll make sure that they're shared with Sara and the panelists as well. 
I'll now hand over to Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Madhushri, and, and also to Science uh, Gallery Bangalore for organizing this session. Uh, hello and a very warm welcome, uh, everyone, to this panel discussion on unpacking COVID-19 from evidence to action. Uh, in this discussion, we hope to gain a better understanding of the science of the virus, SARS-CoV-2, the disease it causes and the impact it has had on people and systems in India and also across the world. So uh, we will also explore how different disciplines and approaches need to be employed to respond to the various aspects uh, of the current health crisis in an evidence-informed and a people-centered manner. So uh, Science Gallery Bangalore has, as part of Contagion, has already hosted quite a few fantastic lectures on COVID-19. So if you've attended those lectures, uh, this session may serve as a bit of a refresher, but uh, we will also try to touch upon a few uh, new themes and ideas uh, around COVID. Uh, so the format, as uh, Madhushri has already uh, laid out, uh, will be uh, a Q&A with uh, me asking questions to the panelists. And Ajit also suggested that uh, the panelists might also be asking questions to each other. Uh, followed, um, this would be followed by uh, uh, about 15 minute session uh, where we will take uh, questions from our live audience, that is all of you. So let us uh, now drive straight into this discussion. And Ajit, uh, uh, maybe I'll start with you. Uh, you very unfortunately contracted COVID last year at a time when we didn't know much about the virus or the disease. Uh, you know, you thankfully recovered, but you lived with COVID-19 and you've also been involved in COVID-related research. So maybe I'll give you the difficult task to give us a quick recap on how science on SARS-CoV-2 and COVID has evolved over the last year. What do we know about the biological, clinical, and epidemiological features of this virus and the disease today? Uh, for certain uh, that we didn't know last year. So over to you, Ajit. Thank you, Sarah. And it's a pleasure to be here um, and a pleasure to be uh, speaking on a panel with so many India Alliance funded uh, colleagues, rising stars, as I would call them in biomedical research in India. And um, each of them, like so many scientists around the world has repurposed their skills and experience to, to tackle uh, COVID-19 and to be at the scientific or public health front line. So it's a pleasure to be here with this group. And as you say, Sarah, it was Friday, March the 13th, actually, very early in the pandemic. So Friday, March 13th, 2020, when I contracted COVID myself, I was walking home from work. It was a significant day because it was the day that the UK's uh, COVID testing system was overwhelmed. That was the day that uh, they ceased testing in the community and just said, we, we just can't cope with testing anymore. And now tests will be reserved only for hospitals. So it was an admission that the ability to contain the virus through tests and training as countries like Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong had done so successfully. It was an admission and national lockdown. Looking home, I was feeling rather low and cold. And the coldness was because I was developing a fever, which I only realized a couple of hours later before going to bed when I spiked to 40 degrees Celsius. And um, on the way home, I thought I was feeling depressed for the first time because of a scientific paper I read, which was I read it just before leaving the office. And it was a paper that showed the following fact. I mean, already I knew that this virus was about as bad as a virus can get in the sense it was more virulent than flu, more transmissible than flu. But this paper showed that it was also people with COVID are infectious for two days before they get symptoms. And as I was going home, I realized I was actually depressed for the first time from reading a scientific paper. Usually you read a paper, you're inspired or you feel you need to work harder or faster. This made me depressed because I thought, how will we ever control this? if it's infectious for two days before people get symptoms. And of course, we haven't been able to until the vaccine. So the vaccines are really what has got us out of it. Over the next two weeks, I languished in bed with daily temperature of 40 every day and could feel a raging immunological battle in my body. I felt like my immune system was battling the virus. And by the end of the two weeks when I recovered, I really felt that I was like a burnt out battlefield inside. Now, in the years since, we've learned so much about that battle. And we know now about the virus, the immune response, the interaction, the pathology. And I think 
it's a incredible uh, it's been incredible to see in real time how science has come together all around the world and different specialties to tackle this it's it's truly breathtaking to see what scientists and what science can achieve in such a short time when faced with an existential threat such as this so i think this is a whole incredible story in itself and it's endlessly fascinating and before uh, i finish i'll just make two other points and one is that whilst in terms of the science and the public health response whilst the vaccines are the exit and the path out of it what's happening is we're moving from the first major battle which the vaccines have enabled us to win to to win to declare victory but we're moving now into a long term campaign something that's more like guerrilla warfare where variants will go on arising in different pockets around the world and then spread so now we're moving into a, a long campaign of guerrilla warfare which is uh, still going to need scientific skills but it's going to need other types of skills as well which are very relevant to the panelists here which is why the panelists are so we have such a great group of panelists today because the skills we're going to need are not only the scientific <laughs> ones of dealing with the new variants as they emerge and spread but also to achieve public health protection we're going to need to understand how the pandemic affects inequalities society and poverty in general and on this point i'll just conclude by saying that to me it seems that covid-19 has been like a torch because it's shone a bright light on existing inequalities but it's also acted like a wedge because it's driven those inequalities is 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 made the gap of inequalities even wider acting like a wedge so um yeah yeah i i uh, couldn't agree more with you uh, ajit uh, and we will be exploring some of these aspects of the pandemic uh, in this discussion so uh, thank you very much for for that and uh, uh, so shahid if i can bring you in next uh, you are someone who studied uh, viruses for uh, many decades and so can you help us understand our relationship with viruses and the kind of role they play in nature i guess you can uh, address the question what will happen if all the viruses disappeared because that's really what uh everyone is wishing for right now well uh thank you sara and just like ajit said it's really a pleasure to be on this uh, panel okay so let's imagine a scenario where all the viruses disappear let's let's play this uh, this little thought game uh no polio to make children cripple uh no influenza to to make you feel bad for a couple of days every year uh no ebola for those gruesome scenes no rabies so you can not worry about dogs uh you know the very first thing that will happen if if all the viruses disappeared there would be no need for virologists but uh <laughs> you know to be to be more serious about it uh you know that is just not possible the fact is that we live in a world full of viruses and these viruses are uh you know extremely abundant and these are extremely diverse it is estimated that the oceans alone contain more viral particles than the stars in the universe uh it is estimated that uh, mammals not just humans but mammals carry at least 320000 different species of viruses um so but the important thing is that you know we can't continue without viruses for example uh we would not have evolved from that primordial soup had it not been for elements that made the viruses uh you know for example one one thing that has developed in mammals uh, due to viruses um uh, is the fact that mammals can get pregnant uh you know if it was not for viruses we would all be laying eggs uh we would not be able to store memories uh you know there are other genes uh, that are co-opted from viruses to regulate 
the growth of embryos, uh, regulate our immune system, resist cancer. Uh, and you know, the, the, the fact is that the diversity that we have on this planet uh, is because viruses have triggered major evolutionary transitions. Uh, so eliminate all viruses as in this little thought experiment that we did. And the immense biological diversity uh, that graces our planet uh, would collapse. Uh, so the virus is a parasite, yes, but uh, like many other parasites, uh, they can be beneficial as well as uh, cause harm. And if you really think about it, our own relationship with viruses, uh, if you agree that the purpose of life on planet is to propagate life and make more life, uh, then the purpose of viruses is to make more viruses. Uh, and therefore, a dead host or a severely ill host is of very little consequence for a virus. A dead host does not transmit. A severely ill host is not able to move and therefore transmit very efficiently. So viruses normally uh, evolve into a relationship with their hosts so that they don't make the host very ill or, or make the host die. It happens when we are in the process of establishing that equilibrium. So for example, uh, common cold viruses today, other coronaviruses cause about 20 to 30% of our annual common colds. They infected us at some point in our, in our history and no longer do that. They no longer kill us. They do continue to infect us. And so, you know, given enough time, SARS coronavirus 2 or the COVID virus is going the same way. Uh, so this is a complex relationship and has everything to do with, with, with evolution on, on this planet. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shahir. And so what I understand is that we just have to live with, with viruses. There's, uh, uh, and, and of course, with, with the current, uh, with the coronavirus, we will be, uh, I think, uh, variants are inevitable. Uh, Chitra gave a fantastic talk on SARS-CoV-2 variants on contagion. So and, I would and let me let me add, Sarah, for yeah. all the for all the college students or or kids uh, who are listening to this, become a virologist. There is good future in it. <laughs> and yeah, that sounds a bit scary, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, but. Yeah, I, I mean, so I, I I was just saying that Chitra gave a really nice talk on SARS-CoV-2 variants and contagion. And so I would recommend the audience to watch her video on Science Gallery's YouTube channel. And I will probably not cover the same questions that she fielded in that uh, session. So, but Chahid, I'll come back to you. And, and I would like you to walk us through the role of genomic surveillance in monitoring the virus uh, variants um, of, of the virus and in controlling the pandemic. What does it really involve and what do you think are some challenges or for that matter, some uh, strong points of genomic uh, surveillance in India? Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting that, uh, you know, we are talking genomics in, in a very, very big way in a pandemic, possibly for the first time. Recall that, you know, when 100 years back, uh, Spanish flu hit the human population. Uh, in 1918, we did not even know what a virus was, let alone a virus sequence. Uh, the concept of a virus was there, something that can pass through very fine filters. But beyond that, we knew nothing about that. And in fact, it was very hard to con control Spanish flu because for a long time, people thought it was caused by a bacterium. Uh, but you know, you you move hundred years down, uh, and you know, within a week, we knew what uh, was causing this pandemic. Just a few years back, when this when SARS one came, it took uh, you know almost three months, four months to figure out what was causing this pandemic. So uh, this has really been the power of genomics. Now. Uh, what genomics tells you is how viruses are changing, how this particular virus is changing. 
as it evolves with the human population. And therefore, multiple variants arise. So there is an estimate, for example, that uh, by now, uh, over 750 mutations have happened just in the spike protein of the virus. And these are the ones that we have been able to see, which means that there are many, many more mutations which have been deleterious to the virus, which we will not even see. Uh, so knowing what mutations are coming up allows us to figure out whether our immune system, whether, for example, the vaccines that we are getting uh, would work against these or not. Uh, it would tell us whether the virus is becoming more transmissible because now in the days of uh, you know, very high uh, resolution structural biology, you can tell whether a virus is binding more tightly to its target cell or, or otherwise. Uh, so there are, there are many advantages to doing this tracking. So to, to really summarize, you, you do sequencing to figure out two things. You figure out what is dominating in your population, what sort of variants are floating around in the population uh, across the world, across different countries, within countries, different states, all of that. But to my mind, a more important goal is to figure out uh, what is beginning to emerge before it actually starts spreading in the population. Uh, so genomics gives us the tools to do that. And of course, once you have the genomic information, uh, see how quickly a vaccine was designed. Uh, within 42 days of the sequence of the COVID virus being available, the first vaccine was shipped from Moderna to NIH for human trials. And in 63 days from the knowledge of the sequence, the vaccine was put in the first human for the trial. So that's why we have come up with that so quickly. But there are multiple advantages to apply genomics. Thank you, thank you uh, for that. Um, so I think you, I mean, you spoke about that. The, we, we learned a lot during this pandemic. Uh, there've been new tools that have that we've used to understand and also uh, control the pandemic. And I think uh, it would be right to mention epidemiology is is the new buzzword during this pandemic. And I think no scientific discipline has shot to fame, I mean, deservedly so, as uh, epidemiology has during this uh, pandemic. And that's because it has indeed been a very critical tool to assess the factors determining the course of the disease and also help us come up with evidence-informed measures uh, to control or reduce the spread of the virus. So, um, so Giri and Yogesh, uh, I, I would like you to come in here and, and, and also walk us through how epidemiologists study an infectious disease and what have been some stumbling blocks for this type of research in India, uh, particularly during the pandemic, uh, both in the urban and, uh, and rural settings. So uh, perhaps Giri, you can go first and, and then. Thanks, Anna. So yeah, as much as we would like to believe that uh, there is uh, uh, probably uh, increased recognition of epidemiologists. I uh, also feel that as the world is facing the pandemic, uh, the kind of data that is being available uh, for epidemiologists to make uh, any useful inferences is not there. I often compare epidemiologists to uh, firefighters uh, because when there is an epidemic, you would want to believe that you have the advice and counsel of epidemiologists available so that you control the outbreak. But then just what happened between the two waves, uh, you would not then look at the data and then again, uh, put in a system of epidemiological surveillance to understand where we are and where we are heading. So as an infectious disease epidemiologist, people are more interested in identifying clusters of cases which warrant attention. So as any epidemiologist do, this is basically science and data of ensuring that uh, both an art and a science in terms of looking at the data, make valid uh, inferences, look at cause and effect associations, and then apply this knowledge to controlling the disease or any health problem in the populations. 
So when we are planning to do this, we need to understand uh, the three triad uh, components of the triad, which is agent, host, and environment. Just in the context of COVID-19, uh, we would see that the agent, which is the virus itself is changing. So as an epidemiologist, you would have to track that. What are the new variants in circulation? The host uh, is also vulnerable. What is the proportion of the human beings who are protected uh, due to vaccination? How many are still uninfected and therefore susceptible? So that's the host related factors. Environment, we saw what kind of super spreader events in India occurred, which facilitated this faster transmission. So as an epidemiologist, you observe the data, collect the data, make valid inferences, and most importantly, warn uh, the system in terms of what actions need to be taken. Without actions, there's no point of collecting all the data or making any analysis. But for that action, you will have to convert all these analysis into some useful points, useful action points. So uh, from the context of India, one could say that uh, when Maharashtra started seeing peak in cases, if you were to warn saying that, look, probably this will scale up. And we also probably did concurrent genomic sequencing and made the results available at the same time. Maybe we could have prevented uh, other states from getting um, the kind of uh, transmission that we saw in Maharashtra. So the focus on epidemiology is important, not just for infectious diseases, but also for controlling all the other health problems, especially the growing burden of non-communicable diseases. So uh, as much as we need virologists, uh, epidemiology is the science and the art uh, required to control a uh, disease uh, in human populations. So together, uh, virologists and epidemiologists can make useful contributions to healthy society. With that, I'll pass on to Yogesh for his inputs. Thank you, uh, Giri, and thank you, Sarah. And it's wonderful to be here. And uh, I believe that there are young, um, uh, young viewers of this program. And uh, what I would do is, Giri has very nicely elaborated what epidemiology is about. And the simplest thing in epidemiology is essentially counting cases. So counting people who had in, who had been infected. And the challenge, like I work in the rural and tribal area, and the challenge that we faced is how do we count patients with COVID? So there was no test available. Early on, uh, you almost felt helpless and you felt like you are in medieval times, that you cannot, you cannot count people who are infected with COVID because the tests were simply not available. Then you can go by you know, counting people who had fevers. So that's a very simple crude way of uh, you know, finding patients. But then if you are working in a tribal area, which is endemic for malaria, the challenges that are posed is how do you differentiate a fever from that of COVID versus that of malaria? So again, one more challenge. And then in rural and tribal area, when you're working, you see this interesting interplay of sociology and epidemiology. So we started counting patients with fevers because we did not have access to uh, laboratory tests, which were very difficult to get into. And what the government had started doing was those who they suspected as having COVID, they quarantined them. And the quarantine was not something that people found uh, very pleasant, right? So although they, they knew that, you know, they are trying to protect society, the quarantine actually converted, uh, created a, uh, you know, fever, fear among people's minds that, you know, uh, once you say that you have fever, you will be quickly put into a quarantine facility. So we are going and counting cases with fevers, but soon people realize that if I say yes to that question, I'll be put into quarantine facility. So very interesting intermix. So people quickly figured that out in two to three months and they stopped answering yes to the fever question. So again, as I said, the science here is playing out or, or, or the technology is playing out in the context of sociological factors. So the simple act of counting cases became become very, very, very difficult. And it still continues to be. I mean, now we have access to the tests, but in my clinic, uh, you know, if someone has fever, people are reluctant to tell that they, are, they have fevers. They will say that, oh, two, three days ago, my body felt warm. They don't want to utter the word fever because they know the moment they say fever, the next thing the doctor is going to do is do a COVID test. So some, uh, sometimes people have outrightly refused that, you know, doctor, it's possible that I might have COVID, but please do not test me. So, you know, it, it, it plays out uh, into this interesting socio-political context uh, in rural and tribal areas. 
really helpful. Thank you so much, uh, Giri and Yogesh, for giving us that perspective. And uh, and I can already see a team forming a virologist, epidemiologist, sociologist. I think uh, I think we're very nicely laying out uh, the kind of disciplines and the interdisciplinary collaborations that are required uh, to to tackle this uh, kind of health crisis. Um, so. While I can, you know, from whatever I've heard so far, uh, you know, we, we, we can say that the scientific and the medical communities have gained tremendous amount of knowledge on the virus uh, and the disease in the last one year. But uh, we have to ask ourselves, uh, really, if we have managed to convey or relay this knowledge to the non-science public. And, um, and, and so Aksa and, and Yogesh, again, if I can, uh, considering you work quite closely with communities, uh, if I can bring in, bring you in now and ask you about what are what have been some prevalent misconceptions about the virus, about the disease, uh, um, um, in in the communities that you uh, work with, work in, and you know what could we have done better to communicate the complex and constantly evolving science on COVID nineteen uh, to non scientists. So Aksa, maybe you can start, and then Yogesh, you can uh, add. So I've been really enjoying this very uh, fantastic discussion, you know, which is happening over here. Uh, so I really want to listen more and speak less. But yes, this is a very vital question that you've asked, you know, because we may have the best of the science, but if you don't know how to communicate it, then as Yogesh mentioned, you know that fever is the symptom of COVID, but your patients also know that. They also know that loss of sense of taste and smell is also a feature of COVID and therefore they'll, you know, run uh, at the first opportunity they get because they don't want to be shoved into an ambulance and then put into a quarantine center where if they die, they will not even get a proper funeral. And these are legitimate fears, you know, which the community is having because they've seen these things uh, unrolling in front of their own eyes. So when we talk about the prevalent misconceptions, which we know are wrong, but people think they're right and they're belief is very strong that what they think is right because they read it in a WhatsApp uh, chat in the morning, you know, and it's by a very reliable uncle who always sends all the correct information. So the first and foremost is the, there's no trust in the vaccines, you know, people think that, oh, this vaccine, uh, as Shahid mentioned, was made in just two months. How is that possible? It's just saline water. There's actually no, you know, vaccine in that vial, especially which is coming from the Pune factory because it's made in India. So again, you know, there's a trust that the US made vaccine is very effective, but the Indian made vaccine, which is only 70%, and we are used to getting 90% plus for our students, you know. So 70% is very poor performer for us. Uh, second is the thing that this virus actually has, uh, this vaccine actually has the virus. In fact, some of the vaccines have two viruses. They have adenovirus also in addition to a uh, killed, uh, you know, COVID virus. So they're actually going to get infected. And uh, they know that someone who went for their first shot and then returned and then after two days, they were tested COVID positive. So they have evidence, you know, that getting the vaccine can also give you COVID. And now there is a very prevalent uh, conception. I wouldn't call it misconception straight away is that this partial and piecemeal vaccination, which we are doing is actually leading to more mutations. And this uh, conception is there in the uh, medical fraternity amongst the doctors themselves, amongst the healthcare workers, that this piecemeal pace of vaccination slow, which we are doing, and then the waves after waves which are coming, this is actually leading to more mutation. And therefore we should suddenly and completely stop all the vaccination. And that's the only way you know, to get out of this mutation ka vicious cycle just go down a little into the female population and my nurses especially and you'll find that the infertility as a misconception is something very huge even amongst the nurses in my own hospital more than 50 percent of the nurses refuse to take the vaccine and most of these nurses are from kerala which is one of the most female literate state okay uh, and they said no we are not going to we'll wait and watch if others conceive and then we'll probably take a decision, you know, whether we want to take the vaccine. And that's why in the second wave, we had most of the nurses getting infected rather than the doctors who had uh, taken the vaccine. So there are a lot of these um, concerns and uh, amongst the educated community, there's concern about the mRNA vaccine. They say it's a new technology. We haven't really known much about it. What if it causes some kind of cancer? What if it is some form of a genetic bioterrorism, you know, which is being planned by USA to dominate the world? 
So there are so many of these misconceptions. You just need to open your WhatsApp and just have a chat with someone, you know, to get to know this. And we have really failed in anticipating these misconceptions and in targeting them. We said that we are just going to roll out a collar tune in Hindi and everyone will understand what vaccines are all about and all the misconceptions will be gone. So no, we need something beyond Amitabh Bachchan, you know, to convey what these vaccines are and how effective they can be, you know, you know as a tool to fight COVID. Over to you, Yogesh, for your inputs. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Aksha, for uh, elaborating what are the common misconceptions. So I'll start from, uh, you know, the rural population and part of this also applies to urban population. So we are starting with a new virus, a new disease. So there is a lot of, there is, we start with lack of information. And then there is this journey from lack of information to distrust, to trust. So, uh, and also part of, uh, in, in that part, we also have a denial. So in rural India, when the, uh, when the first peak came in, there was big denial that this is a disease of cities. They have hardly seen any cases. The other uh, misperception was that, you know, we are hard workers, we work in farms and field, our body is much healthy. Uh, you know, we have been exposed to all these bugs, so we would be fine. And part of that was also, you know, the scientific, uh, in the scientific community, one hypothesis was floated that, uh, you know, oh, those who are exposed to dirt will probably be protected. And actually, in, it, may, it may have led us down the very wrong lane. So uh, it was there. And as I said, uh, that in rural India, you don't have access to information so much as you have in urban communities. Plus, you have people who have not gone to school. So they have not uh, gone into the habit of, you know, believing whatever is written in the books and people go by lived experience. So essentially whatever you tell them, they have to match it with their own lived experience. So in the first wave, their lived experience was against the warning that was given to them by media and other, uh, you know, other platforms. So people, uh, you know, took it very lightly, even during the second wave, when they started seeing deaths, that's when people started taking it slightly seriously. So uh, again, as I said, there is huge misperception regarding you know, rural population being protected. We will not get infected. And again, as I said, people go by lived experience. And the last lived experience they had was uh, you know, uh, uh, the flu that we had in 1918. So there is, any, there is nothing left in the community in terms of collective memory. So people go by uh, those collective memories. So what they could do is they could relate it to the, the epidemics that they see in cattle. So there's something that they call Murray. Murray is essentially uh, uh, epidemic. And so they could relate to, you know, they getting Murray in chicken. So, you know, whole, you know, group of chicken just suddenly die. So they're expecting something like that to get fearful about. So, uh, you know, unless they see too many people dying around them, they, uh, the behavior won't change. And what we saw is in certain villages, you know, there were uh, these programs, especially marriages. And after that, suddenly people got infected and died. And that's when they started getting serious. They started thinking that this is a serious disease. And coming to vaccination, as Aksa has very nicely mentioned, it's, I think the, the rumors are pan-Indian. I mean, even uh, the rumor that was floated on WhatsApp that all people who received vaccination uh, are going to be dead in two years. And I was completely surprised that you know, the, 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 the origin of this started somewhere in France and uh, within 24 hours in rural tribal regions of Gatchuruli, people are talking about it and doctors are scrambling how to, uh, how to counter this uh, type of perception. So it's a fascinating interplay. So, you know, on one side, we have technology in the form of, you know, ability to detect the virus, but on the other side, we have a much bigger challenge of human psychology. So it's a fantastic spectrum starting from virology to human psychology and how they interact with each other. Thank you, Yogesh. Uh, Ajit, yes. Would you like to come in? There is a nice saying, Yogesh, I forget who said it now, some very famous person, might have been a former US president or, or might have been Mark Twain. I think he said that rumors and falsehood spread around the world while the truth has barely even got its trousers on. You know, <laughs> before the truth can even get its trousers on to get out there. This is an example of what you're giving here. And I think here there is there was a competition between the virus and the rumors who spreads fast. And I guess right. you know hands down the rumors won. Right, right. Unfortunately, um, so while we're on the topic of vaccines, thank you very much, Aksa and Yogesh, uh, for sharing your thoughts on uh, you know misconceptions and how we really lack in communicating science to the public. Um, I mean, Shahid, if I can bring you in again and ask you, uh, you know, as an expert, what do you look for in a vaccine data to ascertain whether a vaccine has been tested properly and is safe and effective? So if you have to just uh, share a cheat sheet with the people on what right. is that you look for. So uh, remember that as opposed to drugs that are given to people who are 
ill, vaccines are given to people who are healthy. So uh, you have to really test vaccines mainly for safety. Uh, and of course, they, they're supposed to be good at, at doing what, what you want them to do, and that is the effectiveness. So, you know, even though we develop vaccines very quickly, uh, they really have, haven't been any cutting corners on safety. Because uh, when a vaccine is, is uh, being developed, it is first tested in animals. Then it is tested in humans in three separate phases on increasing numbers of people. So what, what many people don't realize is that in all three phases of clinical trials, safety is a very important component that is looked at. Uh, the efficacy of a vaccine is tested only in phase three. And you know, there's also a lot of misconception about what efficacy is. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you one misconception is that if you take a vaccine which has uh, efficacy of 70%, it would mean that if 100 people are given the vaccine, 70 will be protected and 30 will not be protected. What if I am one of those 30, right? That is not what efficacy is. Efficacy means that for a vaccine with 70% efficacy will protect everyone who takes the vaccine and reduce the risk of severe disease by 70%. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that, you know, 30% people will not, will have no protection. So then, and, and also that the, you know, when you report the efficacy of a vaccine, that efficacy is for the trial period. If the efficacy was estimated over a period of three months, that's what it is. It is not in perpetuity that a vaccine will 90% efficacy will continue to have 90% efficacy. So what you really need is effectiveness. And effectiveness is something that can only be tested in what we call phase four, which is after the vaccine is rolled out in a population. Unfortunately in India, we are not doing uh, these effectiveness studies very well. What we actually should have been doing is to, uh, is to look at a lot of people who got infected in phase one, uh, in, the, in wave one, the, the, the first wave of infection, followed them over time and that would have told us how long the immune response lasts, whether uh, the immunity is largely based on antibodies or T cells also play a role in all of those things. We haven't done any of that. We still have a chance to do that in this, uh, in this wave. Uh, and I hope that people who uh, control the samples, people who control these clinical trials, uh, will uh, address that because they are the ones who have access to, to these samples. Uh, so uh, I would say safety is the primary thing uh, to be looked at and of course uh, effectiveness. And you know we were surprisingly lucky with COVID because remember when vaccines were being developed, the benchmark was 50% eff efficacy. Anything with 50% efficacy goes forward. Uh, and practically every vaccine that was tested had more than 50% efficacy. So sort of 70% became the benchmark really. Uh, and I think most vaccines uh, uh, go up to that level. Uh, so one very common question that is asked is, in India, there are two vaccines available, which is better? Now, there is no way you can answer that question because Covaxin and Covishield were never tested against each other. They were both tested against a placebo. So you can't say which is a better vaccine. Yes, you know, they give different kind of responses. One gives better antibody responses, the other gives better T cell responses, but you know, that's not for the general population. I, I think what is important is that the vaccines that are available to us are safe and they are by and large effective. Yes, variants, when they come through, they will be breakthrough infections. No vaccine in the world has claimed that these vaccines will not prevent infections. They have only 
claim to prevent severe disease and protect from mortality. So that is what we have to worry about. And of course, all this blood clotting thing and everything that, that came about uh, uh, really confused people. And if you really look at the uh, risk of getting a blood clot, that is about one in 150,000. The risk of dying from a lightning strike is one in 138,000. So the risk of you dying from a blood clot is about the same as the risk of dying from a lightning strike. We don't worry about a lightning strike. I mean, driving a car on Delhi or uh, any other road is far more riskier than taking a vaccine. But unfortunately, we don't communicate it like this to people. We just wave off our hand and say, no, 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 they are good, they're effective, you should take them. But that's not the way to do it. Yeah, you know, we, we need to explain to people why it is important for them to take a vaccine and why everything in medicine is risk versus benefit. And at this time, the benefit of taking a vaccine far outweighs the risk of taking a vaccine. Thank you, Shai, that was very helpful. Um, I'm, I'm uh, mindful of the time we have left. So I'm going to um, jump to Ajit uh, again. So Ajit, UK has used technology quite effectively in tackling the pandemic and also in providing medical care uh, during the last year. But considering the large uh, digital divide in India, uh, how do you see India leveraging technology to respond to this pandemic? Uh, other than, of course, uh, de developing apps like Covin and Aradisetu, are there any lessons from UK that you think we could apply or test in India? Uh, uh, and of course, uh, Giri, Yogesh, uh, and Aksa, we, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this as well. You know, I was just reflecting on that whilst listening to Aksa and Yogesh, in fact. Um, and what I would say is this, that initially when the first wave arrived in the UK, the country experienced a really awful pandemic, the worst, the worst outcome of any developed country in terms of deaths per capita. Second worst outcome, I think, in terms of deaths per capita of developed world is the United States. And the worst outcomes in more populous, uh, lower and middle income countries have been in Brazil and India. So it may be that there's some correlation between bad outcomes and inequalities in society and populist governments, because these four nations seem to have that in common. Um, certainly UK and US amongst the developed world are the most unequal societies. And at the time of the first wave uh, had uh, populist leaders. So we really basically fell down like a row of dominoes collapsing in the UK. But as the world can see in the last six months, we've gotten back on our feet and we've gotten back on our feet, I think for two main reasons. One is the UK, as I know well, as a clinical uh, academic investigator, is that the biomedical scientific research community and enterprise in the UK is amongst the best in the world. And the way it links to the health service and the public health system is outstanding. The processes of doing good science, discovering answers to important questions, and then putting those answers into practice to protect the health of the population is generally done really well in the UK. So the initial response that depended on immediate health protection measures was a disaster. Hundred and you know, I mean, many hundred and twenty-five thousand people dying is a disaster. Months after that disaster, the science that was taking place began to feed in to new technologies and new policies, and that was very successful. Now, the second successful thing that the UK has had is um, the effectiveness and equalness of the National Health Service, because as I said earlier. COVID has been a torch that's shone a light on health inequalities, but a wedge that's driven them further apart. But at the same time, the NHS and its equitable, free, super efficient nationwide distribution of vaccination is a, is a, is a marvel. It's a marvel of modern healthcare service functioning at its best. And 
it's been breathtaking, the progress, and that is our route out of the pandemic in the UK. And it's a one-way street. So yes, with the new Delta variant, we're having a bit of a hiccup. Maybe we have to delay the full return to normality by a few weeks, but basically it's just a matter of that. Main thing is it's a one-way street out of it. And that's because as Shahid would tell you as a virologist and Giri as an epidemiologist, basically there's no space left for the virus to invade because once you have 70, 80% of the population immune, whether from prior infection or from vaccination, the virus has nowhere left to go. So um, it's an amazing success. So I would say the two reflections then re relative to India, which is what you asked for, Sara, are the, the way the medical research and science links into practice and policy. And I think in India, from my uh, involvement in India Alliance, that process is slower and less joined up in India. But I know that India Alliance and India Alliance funded fellows are doing their best that they can do to improve that situation. And then the second thing is that the UK has this national health service, which rolled out the vaccine fastly and fairly and or fast and fairly. And I think uh, there in India, it's a very, it's a very different situation. Thank you, Ajit. Uh, Gili, do you want to reflect yeah. on this? So I, I think, uh, Sarah, you were asking about the digital uh, divide. divide. Yeah. Uh, I would see that this is a greater problem in India uh, because of apps uh, or the digital uh, health that we are probably um, looking out as a aid or tools in terms of improving the service delivery, more than the help, there have been uh, sort of barriers. I'll give you an example, COVID. Uh, this is used for registration of the people to get vaccinated, but most people cannot use smartphone. They cannot register on their own. And therefore, we have created new barriers in the name of creating digital tools to help people. So we, uh, as a country, are probably one of the very few countries in the world which has relied on strong micro planning and mobilization. And we have eradicated polio when the other uh, countries could not do it. And this has been done by simple use of pen, paper, pencils without any digital tools. So I am for digital tools, but if they are creating the barriers, we should wait out and use the existing system before we can adopt uh, systems which are more complicated. The other aspect of uh, using the digital tools is uh, the concern for privacy and confidentiality. So if you are uh, getting all data and then putting up on, I mean, uh, one of the uh, city corporations data was available for free download with all the names, phone numbers, their addresses. This is not what the digital tool should do. So we speak of this in research, but in public health implementation, we should pay more attention uh, that these tools don't become barriers themselves. Very important points. Uh, Aksa, actually, uh... Ajit has uh, already shown light, uh, light on, or rather highlighted the inequalities that uh, you know have been magnified uh, during the pandemic. So could you also talk about you know the digital divide as a uh, issue and and just the inequalities that we're seeing? Yeah, I'll come to that. But before that, you know, a very valid point which was uh, raised by Ajit, and just to contrast it with the situation in India, and I think one of the greatest fatalities in uh, this pandemic has been evidence-based medicine in Indian context, especially. And when it comes to how the politicians have, uh, what the politicians have done to evidence-based medicine. And I say this with great regret that uh, unlike many other countries, you know, with a lot of uh, scientific temper in India, we relied more on politicians and some of these businessmen who portray themselves as Babas uh, for the information. So we had the famous Baba Ramdev making a mockery that saw doctor dekho vaccine laga ke mar gai, ek hazra doctor mar gai. And then that's played continuously on your news channels and reaches out, you know, through Radio Rwanda to a billion plus population. You have your health minister releasing coronal with a <laughs> background uh, poster saying that it's WHO GMP certified. And then you know what happens next. 
we had plasma therapy being rolled out in spite of icmr's own trial results showing that it's not effective and uh, we know that it could have been one of the reasons for the mutations we didn't really go for the steroids when we should have gone for them quite early so there has been really you know a real crunch of evidence based medicine and its utility and i hope that you know in the interim period of second and third wave at least we reclaim uh, the importance of evidence based medicine when it comes to inequities you know what uh, giri has already mentioned i think covin is an app which needs to be uninstalled as soon as possible by the government it's one thing you know to make it on a voluntary basis because we want to try out the digital uh, technologies and we want to you know um, a bit like a bridging technology between uh, what we were doing in the past and what we want to do in the future but then to make it mandatory is something very disastrous and especially the inclusion of aadhar as a mandatory thing has not just made it difficult but also put in a lot of mistrust into it and let me tell this for those who are not aware that every time you use aadhar card to uh, for your verification in the vaccination center you are giving consent for creation of the universal health id and that's actually like your health data you know being uh, given to the government and then there is this uh, question as to why amazon web services are being used you know why there is no national level so where is our data going so there's so many concerns and especially when it comes to the minority communities whether it's the transgender community or the religious minorities there's always going to be less trust and the reason for this less trust is the historical you know background which is there so in the polio also we had seen that in the muradabad and the areas around that there was huge resistance to the vaccines because they thought it's going to make their children in for time similarly uh, with the covid now we have seen that there are so many misconceptions around but if you think that we are not we are going to keep our mouth zipped on these misconceptions and they'll go away on their own or we don't care you know if 20 30% of the population does not get vaccinated we need 70% for herd immunity then sorry you are going to create a lot of pockets of unimmunized people and then that's going to lead to outbreaks i'll uh, uh, move on to ajit i think you raised your hand so please add so just really to, to respond thank you aksa to uh, two things what you said that and you know one is just as in a constitution uh, the independence of the judiciary is sacrosanct it's a big topic many things are written about it and uh, i hope in india it would continue to remain so because i know in the past the judiciary in india the supreme court in the past has always been seen as truly independent i hope that will that it does and will remain the case but similarly science and medicine need to be set up as independent in any constitution so that governments don't monkey around with it otherwise you lose the authority uh, and the trust of the public in science and medicine and that helped to save the uk for all of its shambolic performance in the first wave the the the, the scientists and the chief uh, scientific and medical advisors remained independent they retained their authority the government did not uh influence or or turn them into puppets they spoke independently and that helped then to 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 gain the trust of the uh to maintain the trust of the public so this i think if uh you know i would say political uh erosion of the independence of science and medicine is potentially as dangerous to society as political erosion of the independence of the judiciary this was just uh, this is what i uh, what what access comment uh, kind of triggered uh, in my mind thank you yeah thank you ajit um, and thank you also aksa uh, for that uh, there's so many questions where we've hit 5 o'clock and i think it's time to take the audience questions but before that if i could just ask another question to ajit giri yogesh uh, about you know it, 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 could you for a non expert audience give us a sense of what an effective pandemic preparedness look like especially for a country like india so that you know the next time a political party says that you know we are pandemic ready uh, you know what kind of questions should we be asking them so uh, any of you know anyone get this question you know i think what we've had uh, globally because it's been a fascinating time scientifically as we've seen uh, in the, the global response but also geopolitically it's been fascinating and i think the short answer to your question sar is an evidence based answer 
and it's just look at what the countries who've successfully managed their pandemics have done. We got it, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, even Vietnam, less wealthy, uh, lower technology, but we can simply learn from what those countries have done. You know, New Zealand as well, for that matter. Yes, they're mostly small, but Vietnam is not that small and not that highly resourced. So one just has to look, the examples are there. Yeah, <clears throat> if I can add to Dr. Ajit's statements, uh, when in doubt, the only simple and simplest uh, principle to continue with uh, pandemic preparedness is to encourage, to tell the truth. Currently, there's a lot of hiding of data, uh, misreporting of the data, and the way the data is selectively cherry-picked and presented. Uh, like uh, we are presenting only recovery rate, but not the fatality rate. So this should be replaced from a culture which promotes proper collection, usage, and inferences of the data. In order to do that, we have better examples even within India. They, uh, these states and these systems should be the role models. Just for example, polio surveillance in India is world class. Measles surveillance in India is world class. How can a country have world class surveillance system not yet use the similar system for COVID-19. Uh, this baffles me. And uh, not using the partners who are available for data collection and usage. Uh, they, this is a greatest uh, disservice. The respect that the data deserves should be given. That's the way to prepare for any pandemic, sir. Really, really, really important points. Thank you. Uh, anyone else would like to weigh in? Yes, Shahid. I'll come back to trust and transparency and data. Uh, everyone has said that. So let me just say two things. Uh, evidence-based policy making, not policy-based evidence making. That's one. Second is uh, make sure that uh, your pandemic preparedness is driven by epidemiologists not by cardiologists and pediatricians. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Shahid. Uh, yes, Yogesh, uh, do you want to come in? You're muted. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, from a rural standpoint, we need to understand that, uh, you know, rural healthcare uh, is getting, you know, this is something that, you know, we need to discuss about rural healthcare, like 60, you know, 68% of India's population lives in rural India, and rural India has less than 40% of total healthcare person power or resources available. So when we are talking about, uh, you know, inequalities, this is a massive inequality that is in there. And this, uh, you know, pandemic gives once in a hundred year chance to actually see, uh, you know, uh, the problems with our rural healthcare system and try and fix it. So without having, you know, you can't have in pandemics, you have to run at a you know, speed of Ferrari. And then if you have a bullock cart, the bullock cart cannot run at the, you know, run at the speed of Ferrari. So, I mean, we may not go at the, you know, speed of Ferrari, but at least get it to a level of, let's say, Maruti Suzuki. So uh, we need to, it's, it's, our rural health cares are really decrepit. And we need to now invest, this is the best time to actually invest in rural health care and get it to, you know, some level where they can respond to such challenges. Secondly, you know, the responses have to be decentralized. As Giri has mentioned that, you know, we have world-class system of doing simple epidemiological things. And beauty of public health is simple things done right give you great, you know, results. And that, that's, the, that's the beauty of public health. You don't need complicated stuff. You just need simple things done right. So, you know, we, if we could have done simple things right, things could have worked more. Uh, we could have decentralized, given more powers to peripheral, you know, uh, rural health workers, community health workers who know how to communicate with people. And the you know, third major, so one thing, as I said, is invest in infrastructure. Secondly, decentralize. And third thing would be uh, communication. So uh, as, you know, uh, in India Alliance, we talk about uh, communicating science to people. There is also a huge need of communicating science to rural and tribal people, which is even a greater challenge. And, we, you know, we, we have not done well on that front. I mean, uh, for polio and measles, we have actually accrued knowledge of over the last 20, 30 years. We could not transform, you know, translate or transform that knowledge into a, a win, uh, you know, winning situation for COVID. So those are the three things that I would suggest that we need to be well prepared uh, in terms of, you know, facing future pandemics. 
Thank you I, so much. Uh, I'll just add yes, one Aksa. point. Uh, sure. And I think it's the principle which the US Navy developed in 1960, 60 years back. We need to get that uh, right in 2021. And that is the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid. You know, I'm the in charge of a vaccination center. And let me tell you, the process of getting a vaccine is so complicated. It's easier to get married in India, you know, than to get the COVID vaccination. Seriously, I mean, um, just imagine booking this slot, you know, is like a hackathon right now. I think it's time that at least for some time we get rid of the COVID app. You know, uh, imagine it took us five months. We started vaccinating on 16th Jan. Uh, now, yeah, only today the order has come for the near to home COVID vaccination centers. Still, home to home vaccination is not allowed in India, you know while there is home delivery of liquor allowed in Delhi. So you can just imagine how our policies, you know, are so misplaced. So it's really very important that, you know, the political ambitions and technological ambitions are kept a little aside and we focus on the main thing, which is getting the vaccine to the people to end this pandemic for some time. Thank you, Aksa. And I really hope that decision makers and policy makers are listening to this discussion and, you know, will take some uh, a leaf out of this. Uh, all your experiences, actually. So um, maybe I'll I'll uh, uh, so, uh, I'll share a couple of audience questions now. Um, there's one question about uh, uh, you know what makes one susceptible to COVID, given that many young people without any ro uh, reported previous comorbidities uh, succumb to infection. Are we missing out on other host factors that could be responsible for mortality and? Morbidity. Sorry, we're changing gears here uh, quite a bit. Uh, but anyone would like to take this question? Um, Ajit, yeah. I can, I can take that question. In fact, it's a very good question. And it's a question that I've spent since I recovered from COVID in March 2020. It's I've spent uh, a year and a quarter since then trying to answer that question. But in fact, uh, Sibaram uh, Sadangi, I've been trying to answer it uh, from the opposite end. Because your question is, what allows some young people to become so ill with COVID? That's relatively rare. And the question I've been trying to address is, what is it about the natural immune responses of the majority of people that keeps them minimally symptomatic or without symptoms at all and rapid resolution of the virus load in the throat? Um, what gives them good outcomes? And the best outcome is after being exposed to the virus, you don't even acquire the infection. So these are the two questions I've been trying to study. What is it that protects 50% or so of contacts from even getting infected despite exposure? And secondly, in those that do get infected, what are the early immune responses that give them the best clinical outcomes as opposed to worse outcomes? And if I may, just one more minute, uh, Sarah, because I'll go to Sibaram's se uh, second question, which is at the bottom of the chat there, which is actually answerable from what I've just said, because Sibaram has asked, um, you know, as we get new variants, will we always need new uh, 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 modified vaccines, like variant specific vaccines, as we do for influenza every year? And the answer to that, Sibaram, is uh, yes, if we carry on with the current vaccines, which are all based, as Shahid said, on the spike protein. Uh, and that's where the virus is very cleverly. Um, ha having many, many mutations to evade vaccine immunity, if at all possible. But the kind of studies that we are doing in these uh, uh, contacts of COVID that have the best outcomes, we're identifying broader mechanisms of natural immunity, broader immune responses, which would act on multiple different targets within the virus. And a vaccine that could induce those broader uh, more diverse immune responses in the blood, as well as in the respiratory mucosa where the virus enters the body, such a vaccine would uh, be more powerful in the sense it would prevent um, uh, emergence of variants because it would be like the immune system giving a multi-pronged attack on the virus instead of focusing like a laser just on the spike protein. So anyway, hopefully I've answered the two questions in one go there. Thanks, Sajid. Uh, and Yogesh, I noticed that you have uh, indicated that you would like to respond to Siddharth's question. Uh, so Siddharth has uh, asked, um, 
if you know he, he's wondering if there there is a way to incorporate people's lived experiences in designing uh, public health information campaigns better for instance using real life examples of uh, cattle epidemics in uh, oops where did that go um, Yeah, sorry, for instance, using real life examples of cattle epidemics and encouraging protective precautionary behaviors in people. So Yogesh, would you like to respond to this question? Yeah, I mean, it's a yeah. fascinating question, Siddharth. And, uh, you know, we really have to use appropriate analogies for uh, people in rural and tribal area. You can't, uh, you know, pass on theoretical information to them. So, uh, you know, as I said, this, it's a whole different, you know, it, it could in itself be a whole different science of communicating with rural and tribal people. And for that, you need to understand how they think and live close to community and come out with such ideas. And in like while practicing, we often used appropriate analogies to communicate things to them. So one example would be, as you rightly said, the epidemic in cattle. Thanks, Yogesh. Then, uh, they, they, again, as I yeah. said, the other, the other thing is essentially they have very interesting question. One of my friends works in rural Chhattisgarh, and he was saying that you know people found it hard to believe that you are sticking. Uh, you know, putting a stick in the nose and within 10 minutes, you are telling that there is a virus. So people are, they think that, you know, they thought that you are putting the virus in their nose and then so that you, you are able to detect it so quickly. So their question was, how can you detect in 10 minutes you, you are detecting the virus? So these are like very pertinent, very smart local questions. And it's just that we are, we are too busy. I mean, we don't have time to answer such, such questions. So, but unless you answer such questions, People won't, you know, uh, realize the importance. And you have to like commonly give example. For example, an insecticide that they use, it is not, it is never 100% effective. So if you give them analogy that, you know, for vaccine, you know, people are asking for 100% uh, effectiveness or efficacy, you tell them that you spray insecticide, but that doesn't guarantee that, you know, your crop will not be affected. And they quickly see that point and they understand things. So you have to use such local appropriate analogies. Yeah, thank you, uh, Yogesh. Um, there is one question, and I, I, I don't know if this has been responded in any of the lectures that uh, Science Gallery Bangalore has, has organized, but it's something that I'm, I'm hearing a lot about is herd immunity, about attaining herd immunity. Uh, you know, what are the merits of, uh, of this strategy uh, in the absence of uh, biomedical interventions or in the presence of, of, of them, of vaccines and other biomedical interventions? So anyone would like to uh, comment on on this? Yes, Kiri. Yeah, I'll start. Others can join. <clears throat> I think uh, by now uh, it's clear all over that herd immunity is a phrase that nobody wants to use. Uh, Sweden, United Kingdom, uh, in the initial part of their uh, strategy to fight COVID nineteen, whether they agreed or not, at least Sweden agreed um, uh, that they are following uh, herd immunity as a strategy, and some uh, pursued this as the goal. Uh, by the famous uh, declarations made by scientists. Uh, <clears throat> the truth of the matter is, uh, we don't know what is the extent of the infection in the population unless we do a continuously, you know, zero prevalent surveys. We don't know what is the duration for which the antibodies last. We do not know what is the proportion of reinfections in the people based on the newer variants, the Delta variant, which we are uh, now known for. Delhi, for example, had more than 60% people having antibodies. And yet we had a second wave where there were no beds available. Even if you discount the number of people coming from outside Delhi, which means we completely do not understand the uh, prerequisites of reaching population levels of immunity. But what we clearly know is vaccines provide protection whether it is any variant that is uh, available out there. Some vaccines are probably more effective than the others. So the only way forward I would see is the reasonable proportion of people protected by vaccines. Just to give an example from the UK data, from the third wave to the ongoing uh, fourth small peak, there has been more than 90% reduction in the number of cases during the peak. And the proportion of uh, people vac completely vaccinated in this intervening period is around 26%. So which means that not only the number of cases during the peak will reduce, the mortality will re also reduce in the subsequent waves. Therefore, vaccination is the only way forward in understanding population levels of protection. That was really helpful. Thank you, Gary, for clarifying that. Um, 
is anyone else who wants to sir uh, let me uh, uh, let yeah. me just add one other thing in mm -hmm. you know to 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 promote vaccine use and something that we have seen in the second wave uh what we have seen is that states which had high vaccine coverage had low oxygen demand you know oxygen made such a splash in the second wave um so if you consider for example two states manipur and tripura manipur and tripura have almost the same population size uh and they almost had the same number of cases uh manipur required 900 cylinders a day tripura required only 100 cylinders a day what was the difference the difference was that in tripura over 90% people in the age group of 45 to 60 had taken at least one dose of vaccine that was the only difference and you go to bigger states like andhra pradesh uh, west bengal rajasthan and the same correlation holds uh, so what that's telling us is that even one dose of vaccine high coverage in the population uh, provides protection from severe disease and this is something that many people are not looking at simply citing anecdotal evidences that you know so and so took a vaccine and still got back uh, still got infected uh, but you know such data and the availability of such data becomes very important for us to, to really plan that's that yeah looks like uh, i think sara i think sara has frozen but uh, we'll just wait for her to be back but i think now there's in the interest of time hi sara sorry yeah. sorry i <laughs> I I was just saying I was just saying thank you so much. Uh, we've reached the end of this session, and I just want if if we have a few more minutes, I just want to ask one final question to all the panelists. Very brief responses, if possible. Um, so as we continue to battle COVID nineteen, we should not lose sight of, uh, you know, what should we not lose sight of? Uh, so if you you know if you could all just uh, share your thoughts on that. Vaccine, vaccine, vaccine. thank you shahid i think uh, one very important thing is that uh, we should not equate health with covid you know or bhi dukh hai zamane mein so there are so many other diseases and they should not be a victim of our passionate affair with covid so we must focus on them also especially you know other public health importance diseases great thank you aksa uh, ajit I think you know. I agree with uh, Shahid because we know the vaccines work. We know they're safe. We know they're cheap. The UK is a a great national model experiment of you know a whole nation finding its way out of a very very dark and bad place, finding its way out of that, just with fast, equitable nationwide vaccine rollout. So I think uh, in India one needs to do whatever is possible to manufacture enough. distribute enough equitably and to deal with the misconceptions vaccine hesitancy lack of trust that is there in uh, in many underprivileged and underserved communities and uh, it's been great hearing to 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 real frontline experts today on on their experience of that and their ideas of how to to improve the trust and the confidence of uh, of people in rural and remote parts of india in vaccination but i think this is going to be key the production the equitable distribution and then at the very end point actually helping the the public to feel prepared that they can take it safely and it's going to do them good because it is so i think actually you know because there's a million things one could do for covid improving testing tracing there's that so many things but if you said just one thing sara as you asked i think this would be it Thanks, Ajit. Uh, Yogesh and Giri, uh, then we'll wrap up. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I agree with, uh, you know, vaccine. Vaccine is, I mean, you could talk about equity and humane response, but what is going to save people is just vaccine. That's it. So how, how we, you know, how fast we deliver it to rural and tribal area is going to be the key question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I would say <clears throat> evidence-based actions, Sarah, uh, should be the way forward. Mm -hmm. And equity should be at the heart of everything we do, whether it's vaccines or testing or treatment. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, 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 before I hand it over to you, Madhushri, I have to say I really enjoyed this discussion. Uh, you know, getting together five uh, absolutely amazing uh, experts, uh, you know, with wide uh, variety of experience. I think this was a very, very informative and uh, enriching session. So big thank you to all of you uh, and also to our audience for those uh, great questions. And I, I, I guess... Um, I'll, I'll hand it over to you now, Madhushri. And I think a big thank you to Sarah as well for moderating this discussion and I think tying together all the uh, interdisciplinary threads and perspectives on this. And we have several questions in the chat box and I apologize to the audience that we are unable to take all of them at this moment. But as you may know, several of our panelists are very active in the public space. So please do, you know, reach out to them, do look at... Uh, you know, resources that are available. Also check the exhibition site out for a lot of material about the things that we have talked about today, but also talks by Dr. Gagandeep Kang on vaccines, by Dr. Chitra Patra Abhiraman on variants, and Gautam Menon on modeling and understanding how the disease spread. So do um, go back and check out some of these talks for more in-depth information on several of the things um, Ajit, uh, Aksa, Shahid, Yogesh, and Guri have all spoken about today. And we hope that you feel that you're uh, in a place to ask better questions about what is going on around us uh, right now. I'd also like to uh, encourage you, those who may have missed a bit of the session or would like to see it again, the recording will be available on our YouTube channel. So please do go watch it again if you'd like and encourage uh, friends, family, colleagues, those who would find this interesting to please uh, watch the session as well on YouTube. And do share your feedback with us. It's very important that we at Science Gallery know how you, uh, what you enjoyed in the session, what we can do better and what kind of sessions we should do more and more for the public going forward. And uh, do see the exhibition. That's uh, my last sort of a request. And again, thank you so much, Aksha, Aksa, Ajit, Shahid, Yogesh, Giri, and Sarah for making the time for us today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you Thank all, and take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.